When I hear laughter, that's usually a signal that people have finished the exercise. Well, oh, open up new, uh, new adventures in academia, right? Okay, so, so good. I, uh, I saw a lot of interaction and, and uh, a lot of stuff, and this is good. This is what we want. Uh, so we can go through the cases uh, briefly and what we may have learned from them. Case one was the, uh, the uh, PD receives a text from chair and call from CEO about the resident because the um, resident wasn't listening to his patient and uh, then the patient's husband is on the board of directors and, and the foundation calls the CEO and the CEO calls you because the CEO has your number. Um, so the resident didn't know that this is all fuss. And I meet with the resident, this is my case, and the resident's like, uh, uh, I asked, what did you, did you notice anything? She said, he said, well, he kept, he, she kept asking to see me and kept asking for a, a CT of her neck. She had neck pain. And I kept telling her that she didn't need a CT. Uh, she had musculoskeletal pain on exam, so she didn't really need a CT. Um, and I, I said, did you notice anything about maybe her being upset? And he said, no, she just kept calling me back. Um, to talk to her, and I said, well, maybe, maybe she was trying to con convince you to get, do a CT, uh, and he did not have any insight into that whatsoever. Um, and of course, the attending, like two seconds, goes, talks to her, realizes that she's there for a CT, orders a CT, it's negative, as the resident said it would be, um, but she's very happy now. She got the test she wanted, uh, she thinks we're a great ED, and off she goes. So when I talked to him about it, he didn't have any idea that, that she was upset. So my thought on this was he needed to learn something about emotional intelligence. So I asked him if he knew anything about emotional intelligence. And he said no. I said, well, you got some homework to do. And he learned. He actually learned. He came back uh, a couple days later and said, uh, Dr. Spoda, am I aloof? And I said, yes, you are. I, I, I can see you've done some homework. And then he mentioned about doing a, one of the personalities, like a Myers-Briggs type personality scale. And I said, yeah, let's go for that. Let's do that. So I paid for him to have one of those. And he justified the aloofness by being uh, basically an organizer type person who's introverted, um, who likes to keep things neat and tidy and doesn't like to get in anybody's business. So once he learned that about himself, then we start talking about how to interact and how to understand people. And so it coached up real good. Did anybody have that case? Yeah. What did you think about it? Um, I think it's always hard to. Yeah. I think it can be really difficult with those people that may lack insight to get any place to get some headway to be able to give feedback. So I was trying to ask some questions and what do you think could have gone differently or what could you have, what do you think a different resident might have done in this case? Uh, but I, don't, I think those ones are sort of difficult. Yeah, to try to really assess where the problem lies. So sometimes you're not really coaching, you're just diagnosing, right? But with an eye to coach, right? Because this isn't something that you just throw a Myers-Briggs in front of them and say, here, do this and get better. You, you really have to provide some guidance and, and guide them to, to find out because it's self-discovery, right? Any, any other things about that case? Was that? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I added a little bit of this <laughs> because of Dr. Gottlieb's talk the other day about, so my version of this, which sounds like a similar, was that the resident is very task focused. But he's like, well, she didn't have a problem, and I just did the stuff. Um, but the problem is that he's lacking the insight into the uh, emotional issue. And like she said, like when you diagnose the lack of insight, that is often the first place that you can go for a solution to get them to come up with a solution. But someone without an insight to that, that will be challenging. So I'm wondering what you think about coaching that up. You know, is it helpful to actually make that a task? to like make it kind of concrete of like, here is the response, you know, here is frame the problem of like, this person's unhappy, we need to have patients that leave the department happy. What do we need to do to get there to kind of 
show them the path towards insight, or, or is it better to go the other way, just really tell them, like, this has nothing to do with the task, this is an emotional problem, you need help with that? Uh, also, part of it is, you know, like Tom mentioned, in the case, it's like the patient keeps calling you back to the room and sort of sometimes saying, like, well, what do you, does that usually happen? And they're like, no. And like, well, what do you what do you think it means when a patient yeah. keeps coming back to the room and they keep they're they're kind of harping on something? And like, and like, well, I didn't think they needed the CAT scan. It's like, well, okay, well, did the patient understand why you thought they didn't need the CAT scan? And so, and it's interesting because sometimes they say, well, I explained that you know we talked about the Canadian C-spine rule and that there was this a very low chance. And it's like, okay, that's kind of one spot. But sometimes they're like, well, I just said they didn't need it. And so you can also go different directions because sometimes it's a, you know, look, here's how the real world works. When you have a VIP, you don't really, if it's something within reason, like if they're like, I'm not leaving here until I get a calf, you're like, okay, hold on a second. But it's like, this is like low hanging fruit that you can do and, and part friends um, with the VIP or with anyone else, fine. But sometimes they're like, they really are pretty far off into the weeds about being able to read the room and you can do that specific education in that direction. And it was really a reading the room issue more than anything else because um, most residents would have figured out, okay, this person isn't really buying what I'm selling and it's time to get the faculty involved, right? Um, and he didn't even have that insight. So, it's just a matter of, of trying to understand where the person is with the problem and then what's the low-hanging fruit that you can start them at. And for me, it was just like, you know, you didn't really quite read the situation well enough to make this person satisfied. Let's, let's work on that. And that's what we did. So he's, he's doing much better. He's still aloof, but he's aware of his aloofness, and that's... That's better. I mean, he really is doing better. So let's go, let's, for the sake of time, let's keep. So the no-show person. So this is the resident who's not showing up uh, for conference uh, and is risk of not meeting the required 70% attendance. And uh, they don't want to be at conference. And they're probably a bad influence on their peers. Who did this one? OK. So. How do you help that poor soul who's about to graduate and thinks they know everything? Um, hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a med student from SIU. So this was a struggle for me because I don't know exactly how conferences work. Um, <laughs> but I started simply by asking, you know, why are you not coming to conference? Why are you finding them boring? Um, is there something we can do to make them less boring? Um, do you not find this to be a benefit to the care of your patients? Because we are having, you know, conversations at conference is what I'm assuming that's what, conference, what happens at conference. Um, so that is kind of the approach that I took. And then when that still wasn't seeming to get the result, um, I put it back on the resident and said, what if we put you in charge of a conference and have you make it more interesting so that we can understand your learning style and then we can, you know, have conferences that are different in the future to, you know, aid in your learning. That's pretty, pretty insightful. That's really pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that's really good. But, you know, a lot of, you hit on kind of the big thing, because especially with something like this where it's a time commitment, the question is, why? And you always be surprised at what, what you hear. It, sometimes it's like, I, I'd rather be fishing than at conferences. Like, okay, that's one problem. But sometimes it, it turns out it's like, look, you know, m my wife started a new job, and I'm really, we're having a real problem with childcare. And it's like, okay, that's like a fixable, a fixable discrete thing that you can, try to help them, them navigate, or they have a sick relative, and trying to get the, sort of the story behind the story is always really important. And one of the things I noticed, because I hung with this group for the last, second half of it, was that they do a really nice job, in addition to the whys of trying to understand, is they say we. Both sides, they ask we. How can we, you align it, right? It stems from therapeutic alliance, educational alliance, it's not about you or I, it doesn't separate, it aligns. 
And I think that's really important when you start to come up with solutions. How can we make confidence better? Not how can I, not how can you, how can we? And that small change of a pronoun is key. That is a, a huge alignment thing after you kind of understand the problem at least. Yeah. That was really good. Like, I liked your, your plan. All right, three is a faculty one about a faculty that is obviously very knowledgeable but is having trouble connecting with their students and residents and uh, wants to be a more effective teacher but doesn't know how to get there. Did anybody have this one? Did, did any insight gained by doing? Um, I guess uh, with this case, I um, try to explore what, um, how the how the faculty felt on how he could interact or or connect with their learner? Was it a problem of not understanding the generation or how the other learners, how the learners learn? Um, and also giving them tip on how to deal with the BCER, because uh, that was kind of the interaction we had, he was so busy. So it's just how to give them a resource or ideas on how to approach his day-to-day -day bedside manners and teaching techniques. Yeah, good. Some diagnosis, yeah. Getting exercise now. <laughs> yeah, I think um, one thing that I thought was helpful was to um, I try to get some self-diagnosis, but try to get a view of how she felt about the fairness of the evaluation. And so that she then said something about how she thinks it's sort of a popularity contest anyway and that you know she is sort of more formal and these other people are like going with beers and their first name stuff so i mean when you get a little bit of an insight into just whether she thinks this is an actual problem or not and also it helped me figure out what to recommend because you know if you're talking with someone who values the formality telling them to be less formal is non-starter they're just gonna be like well i'm not like that um, so trying to figure out solutions that would work within a frame of her comfort and like what she likes to do, what she thinks is important is useful, I think. Yeah. I don't, I don't, know. I don't know if it worked. That's, real, that's good coaching right there is taking into account the, the needs of the individual that you're working, working with. So that's really good. All right. And then in the sake of time, I'm just going to keep moving forward here. So case four was the resident who liked to debate anti-vaxxers. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Did Start anybody? Sort of like we have a misinformation talk right after this. Yeah. So, so who had that? Anybody have that? Oh boy. Okay. And did we learn anything? Um, I think so. I. I guess trying to help the resident understand how these comments might affect their future profession and career was really what I was. What seemed to be the thing at the end that works the best. Um, I think that, you know, by just saying, well, you shouldn't say this or these things are inflammatory, you know, like that didn't seem to help very much. But I think once I pointed out that, like, maybe you want to be a chair one day or a faculty member, like these things can always be brought back up. They're written down. It's, you know, that seemed to be the most effective. Okay, good. And um, I think one of the things that would have been more, would have been very effective but wasn't brought up was, um, your goal is clearly to change people's minds. This, there are more effective ways to change people's minds, and these are some of them. Which of them would you like to try? That's a good way to put it, too. Sometimes just understanding what the options are or reframing the options is a good, good and, way to And go. especially when someone has that energy like yourself. Yes. Trying to direct them and say, you're not, um, you know, not saying don't be passionate about this, but there are ways to direct this energy. You know, work for, you know, work in a work group with one of your professional groups that is passionate about this topic, so that you have a little cover professionally, and it's you're not seeming like the lone wolf, but also you can uh, put this energy into something positive that is going to reach uh, not the most radicalized people who are going to cause trouble for you professionally but you're going to try to reach the populace and, and try to change their mind or, or get this idea out there in a positive and um, 
you know, less hazardous way for your, your career. Yeah. Okay. Uh, case five is this fourth year student who's good clinically, but um, doesn't adhere to the dress code always and has some colorful language. Um, approaching this student about their professionalism issues. And if you really like them and think they would fit in with your residency, how do you approach them? Because uh, you want to fix this before they start, probably. Did anybody have this case? Okay. Was there anything that we haven't already discussed that was insightful about it? It's more about exploring her perception of the issue. Um, once again, I think it was that was the we spent a lot of time on me trying to bring her around to see the, what the problem maybe, is. Maybe understanding that there is a problem, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes that is, that's a lot of work right there, just doing that. So we, so we also suggested that have the individual identify someone that they consider to be worthy of emulation. And then like, well, what is it about that individual that you would like to be like? Yeah, that's good. Set an example, right? And at the same time, also, so when you're really not getting through to that person about to, where they're just like, I, did, I just want to be my authentic self. You know, on your, in, every, in every state, the, the, the state medical board has cases, everything is, is public, it's in the record after it's been adjudicated. And going through the, you know, giving some of these cases and say like, this is, you know, someone who's down the road who really, their career wash up on the rocks because of these things. And, and that is a, an also helpful way, it's just as an example of, of finding those real world other people down the road where you can say, you are going in a bad direction with X, and, and this is what's gonna happen. Yeah. And just the last case really quick is the junior faculty member who is really bright, hardworking, good clinician, but is uh, very uh, brusque with the students and the residents, and they're perceived by those learners as being dismissive, and, um, and, he, and this person's also critical of any clinical reasoning that's different than their own. So a lot of things going on there, right? Did anybody have that one? Okay. So was there anything insightful that we haven't already talked about? I think she's supported by big ego um, <laughs> while correcting me. Because, um, it was effective. Good. You don't want to piss the person off, do you? Because then they're not going to be receptive to what you have to say. You're such a great doctor. Try this strategy that's really going to help you, Sean. Yeah. 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 And you can, you know, just try it over the next couple of days, and we'll come back together. And, and it, I thought it was, as the learner or the, the bad person, it felt good to me to feel like, I had that option. Yeah. So uh, just to sum up, uh, we wanted to know that coaching is to help our learner reframe their perspective, which a lot of you did a really good job at, uh, to help solve their problem and help them formulate their own solutions. And then the complex nature of the soft skills really allows itself for coaching to be the, the way to go, at least to get some insight and to start. And you need a commitment at the end, right? You want to make sure they have something to do that you can follow up on uh, so you can complete the coaching. Because if you just come up with a plan and then don't follow up on it, it isn't really coaching, right? So when coaches do their things with athletes, they always want to check the check the results and then see what needs to be done and, you, and we need to do the same. So I want to thank everybody for their time, uh, appreciate it, and thank you all for coming on the Friday. You can keep the sheets, I've got like 
five gazillion of them because I was expecting tables and a ton of people on a Wednesday. Um, but it's all good. Thank you so much. Thank you.